I am delighted to welcome Warren Smith, the eponymous founder of the Warren Smith Ski Academy, for this bonus episode of the Ski Podcast. Hi, Warren. How are you? Hey, Ian. How are you doing? Good to see you. Good to, well, it's good to speak to you. Yeah. And um, you're, you are based in Verbier just now, is that right? Yeah, based in Verbier for the rest of the summer and then uh, over to the UK in the autumn. Excellent. How's it looking in Verbier right now? Verbier is good. Yeah, uh, very green. You know, uh, there's there's been a lot of activity with the, the, the evolution of the e-biking. You know, it seems to be getting stronger and stronger. So it's uh, it's good. It's been a really nice summer here. Very warm, um, you know, warmer than normal temperatures. Uh, but, but everyone seems to be having a, a good time. So, yeah, very, very nice. Excellent. Well, I've wanted to chat to you for a long time. We go back a long way in the industry. In fact, I was doing some maths earlier, and I reckon it's about 20 years uh, this year. We first met around that time. We'd both just set up, you know, fairly new businesses. And I wondered if we could just, like, take it back a little bit, even earlier than that, before we met. Uh, You know, I wondered how you got into the industry. What was, your, you know, your background with skiing? I I was very much... um... You know, I, I lived right next to the Hemel dry ski slope back in the day. Um, um, I just skied at the dry ski slopes, kind of spent every day there until I could afford to go away, do a season. Um, and it was brilliant. You know, that, those venues um, built so many careers uh, and, you know, they weren't snow, but they were they were fantastic for getting your legs on, finding your balance. You know, and some of us locally, I remember we used to have a skateboard park there before the dry ski slope and we we... I think we just transferred the skills, you know, that from from BMXing into um, into skiing, uh, and it was great, you know. So so that, I, that it built, um, yeah, it definitely helped build my career. Without that dry slope, I don't know what I'd sort of be doing right now. That's for sure. And and so you're from Hemel Hempstead. Just to clarify, because some people might not even realise this, but you know where the snow centre is right now, the indoor snow slope. There was a dry slope before that, wasn't there? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's it. It was a dry slope. It was a very popular dry slope, actually. And when they were booming back in the 80s, uh, the Hemel was definitely one of the, the leading venues, you know. So I, I was uh, I'm a, I'm a, a very dear friend, Pete, you know, Gillespie still runs that venue, actually. Um, and, and they do an incredible job at Hemel, uh, which, you know, so that, that yeah, it got a lot of history to it. Yeah, well, I actually raced there uh, when I was at university. We did dry slope uh, racing there, and there's a big dry slope uh, racing scene, which uh, isn't as much fun as doing it on snow. But, yeah, it was, you know, we used to go down there for the national finals and everything. So you learnt to ski uh, down there. When was the first time you went out onto snow then? It must have been 1989, 88. Um, I went away with the school, Um and you know you, you saved up your pennies. You got on those early early doors school trips, and then and then spent you know quite a lot of time at the dry slope, and then eventually went to Austria um, and and worked over in Austria, and you know quite lucky got a, got a job in a ski school that helped fund it. Um, but yeah, it was it was it was those, those days are great. I can hardly remember them actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I did a bit of research uh, before our chat, and I listened to uh, your um, conversation with Phil Gordon on his excellent Legends of the Brand podcast. Yeah. I took two things from that that school trip that you mentioned. One was I found it really interesting. I mean, you've always been an entrepreneur. It sounded like that trip was uh, self funded. You raised the money for it yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, I mean, locally in Hemel, I I just did a car cleaning round, so a bucket and a, a sponge and all the rest of it, and you know, harassing people, knocking on their doors if they looked like they had an expensive car, and then uh, <laughs> it was, I was sticking the fivers or a tenors in a little kitty until paid for the uh, the school ski trip. And it was back in that day where there was companies like Snow Coach who were based in St Albans, and that you know, it was actually quite affordable. You know, from that perspective, it's as in comparison to what it might be these days. Um, and a lot of us got away on that that sort of that first trip that sort of got us the bug. Yeah, well, I travelled out by coach quite a few times uh, at school and at university uh, as well. The other thing I heard from your chat with Phil is that that coach broke down on that trip as well. That sounds like a classic <laughs> nightmare <laughs> trip to the Alps. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was quite a cold night that I do I do remember uh, very well to be back. <laughs> <laughs> but you ended up in in Austria. So you in the UK, you got yourself uh, like an ASI qualification. That's the like, the dry slope qualification. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, we all got put through those uh, the dry ski slope, the English Ski Council back in the day. You know that got us that sort of first foot on the ladder. Uh, and then helped. You know, it's, it's always the sort of the fee, isn't it? Getting up the ladder, and then you, you connect to the next bit and the next bit, and and that was what got us to Austria actually. 
And where were you? Where were you instructing in Austria? In a, in a little village called Seefeld, just above Innsbruck. Um, you know that, that was great. Very small sort of uh, ski school type of small village in in a way, and 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 gave us a load of experience, load of training, and um, and then it kind of stepped the pathway towards um, uh, you know Verbier where, where we ended up. So yeah, no Austria was great. I, I mean, I never forget those days. Fantastic. How did Verbier end up next on your list? Because obviously people think of Warren Smith now very much associated with Verbier. It's been your home for a long time. But there are a lot of ski resorts in Europe. What, what, yeah. had, what was it that drew you to well, Verbier? How did that work? Well, always been into free ride skiing you know and, and and the imagery of it and you know watch those films like blizzard of ours and you see sort of like you know john faulkner and you know, mark shapiro doing their photos back here in the day um and then a very dear friend um very local connection from hemel hempstead actually she just passed away sadly um just over a week uh, a week ago but uh, joyce reed who was always involved in the english ski council ran a company called peak ski she put me and pete who i was talking about earlier she put us up got us started where we went over you know we're practically sort of you know no money and and she let us stay in a chalet until we got on our feet in verbier showed us the ropes and and that was kind of it you know we we, we came over in 94 um and uh yeah so, sort of haven't looked back I, I, you know so it's, it's, that was how it sort of kicked off in verbier for us right i i do remember uh joyce i think i helped her with recruitment when i was at uh natives as well and she was always you know uh, one of those people, probably, you know, a really good mentor for you in the industry to start off with. I remember her being uh, uh, very encouraging. So that's what got you to uh, to Verbier. You know, I started Natives, I mentioned that, in uh, the winter of 98, 99. And I think that that was quite a significant winter for you as well, because was that when you joined the, the vocal team, you came onto the vocal team? Yeah, started to ski for vocal. Quite a lot of things were happening then in the free ride sort of scene. The free ride skis were, everything was growing. And, I mean, you know, I remember you guys, natives, being quite a big supporter of all the things that we were trying to do, you know, like whether it was an event or whether it was putting on or supporting something in that free ski space. Um, you know, we, we we worked with you guys really closely. At, you know, actually, it, it, it helped. So we, that was um, a big year. Um we, you know, myself and Guido were making ski films. Um, we started doing that again. You know, we, 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 it was, it was very much a bit of a raw scene. It's quite new, but then, you know, me and Pat joined forces, started to do some free ski camps, things like that. And, um, yeah, it, it was a, it was an evolving time. <laughs> well, some... you've touched it. You touched on so many things there. Lots of them yeah. I want to talk to you about. Had you already, had you, you were working as an instructor there already, were you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, in Verbier was coaching, uh, instructing people, and um, uh, and then in the spare time or whatever time you could get, trying to get off and learn, you know, Verbier's kind of incredible off piste or free ride terrain, and pretty much just hanging out with as many good um, skiers as you could do, you know, to try and better yourself or, or or up your game, and that was that was really what it was about, sort of hanging on in there and and uh, you know trying to learn the ropes really. And and how did that link with vocal? come about then did they uh, approach you yeah it was, it was a friend of mine jamie strachan who many people might know from the ski industry in the in the uk and and a great chamonix guy um a very dear friend he, you know he made the connection for me and um and then uh the thing sort of evolved with vocal and i'm sort of yeah it, it's been a it's been a quite a long journey with those guys and um i'm still on the team but i'm sort of a pushing or evolving my role a little bit into education rather than on a free ski side of things. I'll be free skiing with a Zimmer frame probably quite soon. So I think <laughs> time for a change. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. I, I do. I, I know uh, Jamie as well. And actually you mentioned he's a Chamonix based. Uh, I mean, I've seen him for years, but just in the other room. And in fact, even possibly behind me now, in fact, yeah, you can just see over my shoulder, that one there. Yeah. Yeah, That's yeah. one of his designs for the for the Sham no, Jam. He was very talented yeah. uh, designer and graphic artist, wasn't he? And I think he did top sheets maybe for folk. Uh, right. well. Yeah, he, he 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 made that sort of uh, top sheet design for the the free ride ski with the picture of the wizard on it. Um, uh, Jamie's a bit of a ledge in that space, you know. He still does quite a lot of bits and bobs like that. But yeah, he's a uh, he was a big. I think when we were doing things like the Verbier ride in Verbier, they were doing Sham Jam, and there was just like a really good spirit with that guy he came over and commentated for us helped us quite a lot actually uh, like like everyone did everyone sort of mucked in uh, back in those days 
Hmm. Yeah, exactly. Well, you're talking about that that time there, which really was the the burgeoning uh, era for for freestyle skiing uh, in the UK. You know, it was a very very exciting team, and you were involved, you know, right at the beginning. Then, I mean, you just mentioned Pat uh, a couple of minutes ago, and that's Pat Sharples, who's now you know coach of a GB snow sports team on on that free. And I've interviewed him before, and listen, I'll put a link into the uh, show notes. But, you know, you were right at the heart of that. And I remember certainly at the London Ski Show, you were the guy who was organising all the riders for the uh, for the competition they used to do. They used to have uh, like a, not half pipe, a quarter pipe there, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. L- London was great, actually. I mean, for what budget the, the guys had to work to, which was never an easy, easy budget. It never usually is in skiing. Um, but you know it was a great time when people were evolving it and you know Stu and spence were doing something and doing incredible work designing uh those those venues and then yeah people came across from overseas it kind of brought that international vibe to the london show um it was great obviously me and pat you know the, the, him and the, another mate were messaging the other day about meeting up at nec so i think we've got a a bit of a sort of a a, you know, a, a memory re- reminiscent type of gathering going on, I think, on, on that Saturday of the show. So that, that would be great. But yeah, Pat Pat was great. We, we set up the British Free Ski Camps together, actually, sort of a, off the back of, um, you know, being together around that time that the show was going on. Um, you know, and, and, and it was very much, there, there were a few key players, like the, that's what I was saying about Natives, why it was so fundamental back in the day, because without the, the kind of media strands, um, people wouldn't have known what we were doing or would have been able to find out. And sometimes at that stage, um, the, the mainstream ski mags, or I guess the internet wasn't what it was. They didn't quite reach our audience. Whereas I think the native audience was really specific. Um, and it was already involved in the scene or the, or the, or the rising of the free ski scene, uh, movement. And, and, and that was, it was brilliant. You know, we really did. Um, I think what you, well, you guys did, I think you taught a lot of us about, how to mark well how to sort of reach uh people you wanted to reach if you know what i mean it was a bit of an education back in the day um and we i think we all took something from that yeah well it was brilliant being uh you know involved in it in that era and i think i've referred to you on different episodes of the show before how uh, you know i remember pat uh, brought along um to an event we were doing at birmingham he said oh you know i've got a couple of kids you know who are training at the moment It'd be really nice to uh to have them along and uh it, one of them was Katie Summerhays, who was like 10 years yeah. old or something, yeah, yeah. is now a dual uh, Olympian. But, yeah. you know, I wondered when, you know, with London, um, for years and years at the London Ski Show, you know, they used to have aerials and you yeah. know, they have yeah. people doing those very formal, you know, yeah. aerial flips, which, you know, while athletically entertaining were nothing like uh, the way it suddenly changed and I wondered whether it was difficult to persuade them to kind of do something different and to have a course pipe and have a you know a bunch of young kids throwing themselves around the place yeah yeah absolutely I, th- I think there was something set in stone where I guess the ski show to a lot of people was the, the sort of Saturday reunion for ski pe- bums or people that have done the seasons it was the ski instructors skiing down in unison doing their demos. Um, and then it was definitely aerials and, and that, that was a bit of a change or a transfer and it took a few years to do it, but it, but it definitely, I think there was a lot happening. And like you say, 99 was quite a pivotal year. You know, I, I know me and Pat had kicked off doing free ski camps. There was a lot of international riders. Salomon brought out the 1080 ski, like again, like a big old, uh, you know, benchmark of what was going on in the industry. Um, and then a friend of ours, Francine Merlin, funny enough, I was just watching it on TV the other day, like The World Is Not Enough, uh, the James Bond movie. She she did the stunt double, you know, in, in the skiing scene. And she was a, obviously a friend of ours from Verbier. Um, and it, there was a lot going on and it was breaking through. And that, that like you say, that excitement uh, vibe of, um, of how um, uh, the, I think what you'd saw someone like spinning off of Axis, and how uh, it was it was changing things for um, the viewers, you know, and 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 it didn't hit home straight away, but it did. It, it broke its way through, became really exciting. Candid Tuvex was just breaking onto the scene as like a sixteen year old kid in ninety nine, and you know it, it, there was a, there was some really cool things to watch. But people were being uh, sort of thrilled by it, and then it made its way bigger each year. It just broke through further. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely remember, you know, that 
that vibe. I think maybe people now who are going to show or just, you know, following Ski Sunday or something might just take it for granted that, uh, you know, you've got these, uh, you know, young kids uh, ripping it up in the snow park the whole time. But yeah. it was so new and it was very exciting. The most exciting thing about it was, you know, most, I know you're saying there were international skiers there as well. Yeah. Um, but, you know, so many of these kids were young British people who yeah. had come from the dry slopes that you're talking about, and they just started, you know, the in, the indoor snow slopes had yeah. just started around that time as well. So people were coming from there. And that's that's what really stood out, I think. And, you know, people, uh, holiday makers, you know, who were there gather around the bottom of the slope, were looking at this, and little kids, you yeah. know, were looking at this thinking, this this could be me in a few yeah. years' time. And yeah. actually, that's what happened. <laughs> It's exactly what happened. It's, it's so right. And, I, you know, we were lucky in the sense that there was the background, a bit like what you were saying with the, the aerials. Sheffield had a base of freestyle already. And then the club level, the Sharks that were there, you know, the team uh, the team the, um, that uh, Pat and Andy Bennett were involved with, and they, they were helping to evolve that. Um, and, and you're right, like Warm Well down the south of England, big freestyle scenes, Halifax dry ski slope. So a lot of this stuff was going on in the background. And at that time, again, people were watching the, the review videos online, probably watching them through natives, where, wherever it was going to be seen. And they wanted to get involved and, and they could access it in a way with much less, what's the right word to use for this? But it, whereas, I mean, it, back in the day, you'd have gone to a dry slope, there could have been a club level, may not have felt so inclusive. The freestyle scene seemed slightly more grungy, a bit more inclusive, a bit more like, you know, it, it you know, I'm from a council estate, not, not not ashamed to say it, but it felt like it didn't matter where you were from. You could walk into this scene and it almost benefited you. That You know, it didn't really matter where you were from. So there was none of that that stuff to put you off in the first place. So, so it, there was a bigger catchment net. And like you said earlier, the timing was perfect. And, and, you know, the results are obviously what we've seen in X Games and took Woodsy a few years from from seeing in so many times coming to Sasfe on these camps and things like that, you know, and, and, it, and it was just, you know, God, what, what a thing to have seen that, that first X Games bronze. It was like, wow, you know, things have really changed since we've been yeah, doing it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, so many of the names there, uh, you know, James Woods, uh, you mentioned, uh, Andy Bennett, who I know went on to, uh, to coach uh, with you as well. Also, Paddy Graham was, uh, yeah. you, know, very, yeah. you know, coming along to a lot of those camps, doing those competitions at that time. Yeah. And he's now um, very involved. He's not a, a, like a competitor. He is more involved in the filming side of things, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Legs of Steel. I was just looking at Paddy. He's just been in uh, Argentina doing, doing, you know, getting some incredible snow down there. But he's he's a really respected athlete on the vocal team. But he's he's taken it stages further with being on the Red Bull team. Um, he's a freestyle skier, freeride skier with a really good business sense, and 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 has done an incredible job. I think for the Brits in a yeah, like you say, it's not so much in competition, but but probably getting the same mileage and um and inspiring just as many skiers as a competitor by actually doing it from a filming perspective so yeah r really uh really cool yeah and you know you uh, you know have always uh, been a very busy person back in that era you yeah. did like so many things because like you're doing the instruction side of things you're running the british freestyle camps which you mentioned you had the ride events going on which are these yeah. free ride events um yeah, out in Verbier and Sasfe and in the UK, a whole series of different events there, which was getting giving a chance for these younger riders to compete. And on top of that, you were making movies as well. Like yeah. you said, you know, uh, a Blizzard of Oz was something that inspired you. Uh, yeah. And you mentioned Guido, Guido Perini. You know, actually, I, uh, yesterday I watched um snow odyssey which might have been one of the first yeah, ones yeah, it and was, then yeah. i watched uh, snows in the house uh, as well <laughs> and you know i remember going along to like a premiere of snows in the house you know in leicester square yeah so, it, was, it was very very exciting and he said condi condi Tovex. he was in one of those wasn't he I, how old was he yeah. then he was 16. I think that was when me and Guido went up to Narvik. And uh, in fact, we were in Rick's grandson back in 99, in May 99. And he was just, you know, at, at the time, uh, throwing throwing tricks that we were like, you know, it was, was mind boggling uh, for this young kid. And he's obviously become probably the biggest name, you know, uh, with along with Tanner Hall, probably the biggest name in freestyle skiing, um, freeride skiing. So, 
so yeah, it was it was it was amazing. And and you're right, we sort of somehow blagged our way through, you know, asking one other person who asked another person, or it was probably a client of someone from Verbier. But it was we managed to get these premieres, these these film premieres, and it was it was a it was a bit like um going to a skiing event anyway, like a free stars free ride skiing event, you know. And I think me and Guido, we just we shot that movie on one of those little DV video cameras, you know. It was so there was no budget, and I never forget. People talk about computers these days, and we, me and Guido, spent quite a lot of weeks at my mum's house in Hemel Hempstead, right next to the dry slope. And we were, we were editing the whole movie on a four gigabyte hard drive, and it was like an external four gigabyte hard drive. And we went to the pub every time we did a slow motion effect, like to let this thing render on the computer. Went to the local pub, had a pint, came back, and it had just about finished. And it, it was. Just, it was mad. It was absolutely mad. You look back at it now and it's just like, oh my God, you know, what you can what you're capable of now is just such a different um different for world. For sure, for sure. But you know, you were you were there and you were, you were doing it and making it happen. It was interesting actually to see to move from Snow Odyssey to Snows in the House Three, which I finished with uh, last time. Yeah. Yeah, just yeah, yeah. in a space of a few years. You know, yeah. how the production and values, you know, really improved over that period. I'm guessing you got better cameras as well as yeah. yeah equipment as well absolutely yeah i mean we're getting to work in thing a lot of guys out there use adobe premiere pro final cut pro that's what we, we got used to it computers got better hard drives got bigger things were you know being done in a nicer sense but we're also learning by watching all the other ski movies in the scene it was never us we were never the best guys there was always greater people which you could learn off of watching their videos and like oh my god you know wow that that's the next level so always aspiring and then the, the more we did things like that they're more other people approached us, came to the London show. We got other guys on board from like Chrome Productions who helped out with the um, with with the Snows in the House productions as well. Um, and then, yeah, and then I guess you know from from the side of the filmmaking, you know, it, it, you get to a stage I think where you make that sort of decision, or you get to the the road where it's like you know, do you follow the the academy side of things, or do you keep going down the filming or, or is there you know the verbia ride event so so tried all those passion was always on on filming and and you know running free ride comps um although probably got way too many gray hairs because of it at, at these these <laughs> stages <laughs> but then then eventually you know that you, you you sort of realize that you've got to you've got to pay the bills and, and then that's kind of where the bread and butter of, of the ski coaching side of things is, is more of a stage For sure i mean the amount of time that must have gone into making those films would have been ridiculous yeah. i guess yeah yeah oh god yeah i mean it was i think when snow odyssey came out i definitely went through because of like hard drive failure because of getting the master tape ready i went through like three days sort of two nights of no sleep just straight through and then on the second one which was the maddest story but we did this um we made the film um and we we were at the prince charles cinema and room you know cinemas full of 500 people it's a really good turnout actually and somebody kicked the because we had to we actually in those days had to hire a projector uh to play off our tape to go into this thing and to broadcast it in a different way because we obviously couldn't shoot it onto film and and one of the guys helping us from sweden that we'd met walked by in the cinema this little narrow passageway at the prince charles projector room and he, he kicked out the power cable and i wanted one of you know we saw him going to plug the thing back in we we're like no you know don't don't you had to wait like 20 minutes for this bulb to cool down plugged it straight back in bulb blue so it's going to stand there in front of 500 people say uh it's really bad news but they, they, we haven't got a projector for this and a mate of ours you you remember Stu morgan from oakley um he was well connected with a private members bar called soho house which has obviously become a very big brand he rang this this place up, and within half an hour, we had five hundred like misfits, lunatics, and all sorts of people from the ski industry pile into this private member club on a Monday evening, um, and they broadcast the film along all their screens amongst three or four floors. And it was like, how that? Sometimes when you look back on it, you know, it's how the hell did we even do that and and get away with some of the things we did? But it was it was so loose. It was just a. Uh, you know, it was it was good fun, and and I don't think you really, yeah, you you kind of got to go through that. You know, yeah, no, those are those are the learning experiences, uh, aren't they? But probably yeah. possibly a reason why you, you kind of segued away from, you know, all that time going into uh, movies and the you know, the area that you're most well known for uh, uh, now. But talking about the amount of energy that you invest in things, you know, we mentioned we mentioned the events that you've uh, run, the camps, the movies, but also, uh, you know, you've published quite a few books as well and dvds for that matter yeah yeah, yeah. 
some of which have been uh, i was looking at the one goski uh you know that's that sold a lot of copies is not it yeah, yeah it, did, it did actually a few hundred thousand bowl accounts i mean we we they paid us i mean it was for dk books you know and it was a publishing deal it wasn't i wasn't really I, I wouldn't say i was very well experienced in that space but but did it because it's a great opportunity and, and the book was put into quite a few different languages i never forget it opened a few doors actually in fact leading on to things like the tv show the jump that was mainly those production guys that looked at that book back in the day because it was all about publishing but i never forget walking through st anton like the high street and seeing the german version of the book and i'm like my god you know that is a I wouldn't play the best ski instructor or certainly skier, you know, in Europe. And then you're walking through St. Anton, like this Mecca town. And then there's a German version of go ski on the shelf in this bookshop. And I'm like, it's, it's almost embarrassing. Like what, it, it, what Austrian is going to buy a book of this British guy standing there with a, you know, and, and there was the same as a, <laughs> it's the same in France as well. But yeah, it's interesting. And I seem to remember you telling me at one point as well, that some of your books got ripped off and were published in China. And they're like selling really well in China, but not helping you at all. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, like everything does. I mean, the funny story with that, we, I was doing a video, like typical Academy week in Verbier. And, they, and I think it was 2011, something like that, maybe. Yeah, 2011. So a guy walks up and after doing this video analysis, I was talking to him in the in the room, you know, and, and all I saw was this this guy sort of nodding. There's like, he hasn't got an absolute Scooby what I'm talking about here, but he's nodding and he's really polite, lovely guy. Didn't speak actually much English, but he was really into his skiing. Like, anyway, so, so after the thing, he comes up to me with this book, like, oh, can you sign my copy of Go Ski? And I looked at it because I was like, uh, yeah, but it's in Mandarin. I've never sort of, I didn't, we, we hadn't done any, I wasn't told it was in Mandarin. Anyway, I went back to DK Books or Penguin Books. I said, I've just signed a book for a client and it's in Chinese. And like, uh, I don't think so. It's not, it's not, we've not released it there. We've sent them proof copies, but. Anyway, the long story short was they, they'd got the book. It had been ripped off in China. And um, the next that opened the door is to go into China to start to do, you know, uh, I, I, the only way to make money out of it was to actually sort of show up <laughs> um, and, and, and sort of try and monetize what it was. And we, we sort of did. And, and it didn't, you know, a lot of things out there as, a, you know, you go in there as a foreigner, it didn't actually work out in the end financially very well. But it was a it was an interesting experience. That's for sure. Yeah, I mean, you've travelled to um, you know so many places in in your uh, uh, career uh, through the filming and through that as well. But you, you know, you mentioned you re- referred to lots of different uh, uh, elements there. But it is as an instructor and the Warren Smith Ski Academy that you're uh, best known now. You know, I've always been you know so impressed with how you market your business. I was listening to um, another interview or read another interview. I think you said that you felt you've been a bit lucky that lots of journalists have featured you. But, you know, I don't think that's luck. I think you're a, you know, a really good communicator. And obviously, you know, that's a tremendous skill that you need to have, you know, as an instructor. Um, but, you know, if there is any luck in it, you know, maybe, you know, in the, in the kind of, you know, more recent uh, career, that came when you kind of cross paths with Lawrence Delalio, uh, because you taught him how to uh, ski, didn't you? I wondered how that came about. Yeah, Lawrence has been, um, I mean, a lot of, you know, you know what Verbier is like, there's a lot of people come and go through this place. Um, through a mutual friend of ours, who, funny enough, I met through the Sham Jam guys, going back to that connection, but a guy called Rob Sawyer, who ended up running the Faraday for, for over a decade here in Verbier, Um Really good mate of Jamie Strackens I was talking about earlier. Got involved in Sham Jam. Then he came over, sponsored the Verbia ride. But off the back of that connection, um, introduced us to Lawrence. who used to drink in one of his bars in London. Lawrence was just finishing his last year of rugby at Wasps. And I think the position Lawrence was in, I think he could sort of, you know, almost do what he wanted. He came out and skied and, and he learned to ski one of the seasons he was finishing off his last year. And he did really well. It was, it was odd. He just, he, you know, we could beast him, give him all the, we're obviously quite into our biomechanics of how we teach as part of the principle of, you know, you, you can do a lot of things, but you can't really cheat that element of, of what, how your body moves. And he got his teeth into it. End of the first season, he, you know, he skied some pretty steep runs in Verbier. And, and then he wrote these quotes for us sort of saying, you know, about our coaching method. And I think a lot of people, you know, picked up on some of the things he said, um, a lot of sporting people, uh and and it was great you know he's it was he's been like a in a way a bit of an ambassador for us actually because he's flown the fag and we've 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 done the same back we've tried to raise as much money as possible for his charities um really similar actually to the snow camp charity we work with he runs something called rugby works so that's um 
that's something we tried to throw back into the part. We raised a couple hundred thousand over the last few years for his thing back, you know. Yeah, and just that, you know, maybe, listener, you don't know who Lawrence Alalio uh, is, but, you know, he's an England rugby player who won the uh, Rugby World Cup with England back in 2003. You mentioned he was in his last year of his career. I'm, yeah. I'm kind of guessing he might have had a contract that said he wasn't allowed to go skiing at that time. Yeah, there's there's, there's a possibility of that. I mean, I, I don't know the exact details of it, but he... Uh, you know, and we got to meet the bosses of Wasps. And then, and then I think after that ski season, went back to watch his last ever game, his testimonial game. It was fantastic. I went across with Rob, one of my academy coaches, who's a massive rugby nut, big rugby fan. And we're at Lawrence's testimonial. We're like, we shouldn't really be here. This is like full of all the rugby legends. And we're sitting right at the front. Lawrence looked after us. And we, uh, you know, we, we were quite... Uh, quite gobsmacked you know that seeing this guy in his in his environment not in the mountains where it was like a you know this guy that's just learned to ski we were over in his and like wow the contrast of seeing a true sportsman and what they've achieved it, yeah it was quite quite phenomenal actually but yeah we've kept in touch and he comes out to ski with us a lot in verbia these days and in in fact you know um he he tries to help us where he can and i know he was talking to to Lindsay and, and trying to help, uh, you know, who does the, some of the PR stuff in Verbier and helping her son out with, with some work experience. But yeah, there's a lot of reciprocal that seems to go on in our industry, as you, as you well know. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned about the charity side of things. I, I recall that um, he organized a number of charity bike rides that you went along as well, like quite, you know, epic yeah. rides, right? Yeah. The, God, yeah. There was, I mean, God, there, was, there were some big rides, definitely some big rides. 2012 was started doing that, but we actually went together that summer of 2008 and did a our first kind of what became the Del Elio cycle slam. And we did the Pyrenees. And I know you're obviously a big cyclist, Ian, and you're big into, you know, that type of uh, element of sport, but really, uh, you know, it's one of those crossover things for me in skiing. Like, I love doing the downhills on the other side of the mountain going down fast, but the, um, but, but I also really love the uphill and it, and, it, and it crosses over, especially in ski technique terms of leg extension flexion. I mean, you couldn't really get a better, uh, you know, strength building, stability building setup for your skiing and then, than what cycling actually is. You know, it's, it's, it's an incredible sport. But yeah, done lots of that and, and loved every minute of it. So you, you've mixed with plenty of other celebrities. Maybe maybe he was the first. I mean, Verbier is the type of place where you always get a lot of celebrities anyway. You know, yeah. James James Blunt has been a regular. I, I had an interview. Uh, we did a special with Peter Hardy a while ago, and he told me yeah. all about, you know, when he did a, the book uh, about uh, James and uh, some of his stories behind that. But also the, the royal family uh, as well. Yeah. Um, I, re- I remember one time at the London Ski Show, uh, hearing that, uh, oh, you know, Warren's going to be showing Princess Eugenie round, were you? Uh, you're just showing around the show kind of quietly yeah. around the side. <laughs> well, yeah, she she was great. I mean, you know, because obviously we, well, we, we've always needed as much coverage as we can get in the ski industry because you don't just get given it, really. And I think that's what we've, we've, we've learned that, as you were saying. And um, taught, taught Beatrice um, and Eugenie that season, and, and they – she very kindly agreed to pop the head in the ski show, did a walk around, you know, just as a bit of an ask as a favour. And, and that was very, yeah, very kind, kind of them. Yeah, but I thought that, you know, that was great because, you know, it wasn't like, as far as I could recall, she had a special security detail with her. You literally just, you know, showed her around the show, didn't you? Yeah, no, I mean, I guess, you know, you build up relationships with people you take in skiing, I guess, or especially when you're going off piste into certain environments, you sort of have that trust element. Um, so, yeah, there was, there was more like that. I think there was a guy in the background somewhere hanging out, but it was <laughs> it was uh, it, it was good. I didn't think it was too much. I think it was at the Ells Court show, actually, maybe then. Um, yeah, I, could have been a while ago. And you've also skied with uh, Prince Harry, who I believe has a few freestyle skills of his yeah. own. Yeah, God, yeah, he was he was pulling off a uh, back lips. I remember the security guys. We were skiing. I think we we're off the back of Crepon Blanc, you know, over towards uh, that area uh, up from Civier, and we skied off the back of there. First rock he found, uh, pulled off a front flip, did it again, and then I think there's about three security guys on that one, and they were quite nervous, you know. He was <laughs> he was just he was launching it, and uh, yeah, no, he's uh, he was he, he went for it with his skiing, that's for sure. That that is impressive. Would have been good to get that on film. <laughs> oh, I did. I did. I did. There's, there's a couple sort of deep rooted in my phone uh, of, that, of that particular 
I'll, I'll, I'll ping that across to you. Yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> Excellent. So it kind of made sense, you know, with your, you know, contact knowledge of, uh, you know, celebrities. When you mentioned the jump earlier, when that uh, celebrity reality ski show, The Jump, came to TV, you were brought in as a consultant. Now, I, I love that show. I still miss it. You know, I was lucky enough to go out to Kitai uh, the year Bradley Wiggins and Louis yeah. Smith and Jason yeah. Robertson were all there. And I loved it, you know, kind of being part of it. You know, I wondered in that time, you know, in the different uh, seasons, who who were the best students you had? Who were the best people oh. learning, you know, how to ski? You know, that year you're talking about, actually, uh, people like Spencer Matthews and um, Louis Smith, you know, they got their head down. And these guys were you know you, you saw it for yourself they were actually skiing they started off at Hemel indoor indoor snow center and and they they came along Spencer hadn't actually skied believe it or not he had snowboarded a few times and Lewis was a very low low experience level and and they they nailed it they were carving but they were properly carving like you'd expect when we take people through their instructor training and and to sort of put it you know if anyone's out there sort of gets a rough sort of take on ski instructor levels they were above the level two you know, they were somewhere between a level two level three instructor in the space in a, in a very short space of time and it wasn't that they had tons and tons and tons of weeks because we asked coaching time that we got with them was quite small actually it was a couple of hours if that each day off the back of them doing lots of other sporting things so they sometimes they were quite fatigued but um, those two, and, and also on that year was Jason Robinson, and he was the same, you know, rocked up at Hemel, did a couple of sessions, um, drove the length of the country, actually, to come and do a, you know, couple of extra sessions at Hemel, and they just, their skiing just went through the roof, and, and we've kept in touch, actually, we sort of, you know, even when we do our Ski Technique Lab tour in the UK, popped in and stayed with him, and um, yeah, that, 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 that was a great year, it was a shame it was the last year, um, but it was a great year. But then, you know, exchange rates and all those sort of things have their, they take their, uh, they take their and, and the cost, cost of insurance as well, I think, for Channel 4, you know, became uh, an issue. I mean, it must be really interesting working with Olympians who, who are so skilled in a particular sport and then they get this new challenge that they have yeah. to take on. You know, they've yeah. gone through the process of learning and finessing and improving in a certain area. So they have... Without having the immediate skill set, they know the, the the processes of how to adapt new skills. Uh, so, yeah. you know, working with someone like that must be a real pleasure. Oh, God, yeah. I mean, it was like, you know, from that ex- example of someone who's a sponge, like literally laps up every bit of it. It's always interesting to see the difference on someone's real open mindedness, like zero ego or, or, or on the flip side of it, you can get someone that's got the ego, doesn't want to be told, you know, and you, and you, you obviously get like you would do in a typical ski group, you know, in the mountains, you might get a group of people with exactly the same attitude, but, but certainly people that have excelled uh, in a sporting environment um, and that have that sponge mentality of, of taking on information. God, you know, the results were some of the best I've ever seen in the in coaching career, really. Right. And, you know, you mentioned those who don't want to be told, would you be able to uh, be indiscreet enough to those who were the worst kind of well, learners or to teach. I, 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 we had some people that were were probably not in the best shape to ski. I mean, I wouldn't better sort of say it was, but I think you could probably watch a rerun of the show and go and figure out who that might be. Um, and then there's also, you know, you know, weirdly enough, there was people like Linford Christie that you know, you know back in his day was a fantastic athlete, um, but. Be- because perhaps of the way that he possibly trained as a consistent uh, runner and, and, and you know, he, he developed something in his hip and couldn't steer it, one of his legs inwardly. Um, and we were looking at it from a biomechanical point of view and we were trying to put it down to the idea that he possibly spent his whole career in a gait where he didn't ever want to have an inward rotation of his leg. It needed to be in this certain sort of functioning piston machine-like way. And, and he literally, one of his legs just could not steer inwardly. So we just didn't pick the sport up it was it was blocked from learning the sport um, but that was a real biomechanical issue yeah well that's really interesting because that kind of leads us on I think to where you are now with the with the Warren Smith Ski Academy because as the academy has evolved I think so is your philosophy over the years you know that we that we've known each other and you mm. have a huge focus now on on biomechanics and the issues that kind of come about with sedentary lifestyles I wondered if you could just elaborate on that a little bit yeah i mean we set up a thing called the ski technique lab about 10 years ago and it's kind of like 
we want to try you know, the, the goal of it. You'll, you'll see a lot of, actually at the, at the NEC show you were talking about. But the we want to empower people to do a lot of the changes in their skiing themselves. And, and that's a physiological sense. If someone spends 500 bucks on, I don't know, best instructor in Europe um, and they go along, but they've got, this difference between the left and right side of the body. They kind of, whether they take the ski lesson with whoever they take in Austria, whether they don't take ski lessons and watch some cool clips on online and just want to go and have a great ski, you know, avoid it, avoid injury, or if they come and book on a course with us or whatever they do, the reality of it is if we can get to someone three or four weeks before they come out, we have a much better person to mold into a skier. Um, and if someone comes to us, sometimes it's frustrating as a coach where you're like, it would be wrong of me to try and push this range of movement in the space of four or five days because that's actually going to take you three or four weeks of, you know, some some stability, mobility, flexibility routines. Then we can get you there. So so we've we've come up with this system, which is where we we do six tests and it's it's the you it we basically just look at the six axes that you'd move to make the sport work technically correct. Um, but the content, you know, the moment's free of charge. People can look at it. They can come along to shows. And we're trying to make it accessible. So so we figured out a long time ago that 5% of people take ski lessons. 95% don't. And if we can reach that 95%, one is we can draw them into getting more of a good mentality for education. But the ones that don't, if we can give them something, they've got less chance of getting injured. And they'll probably have a better ski week with their mates and, you know, have a good time on the snow in that sense. And, and so you're talking there about people doing research prior to their trip or prior to, you know, a, a course with you. You know, how much difference do you think an individual skier can make to their own ski ability by improving their their flexibility, working on that, those biomechanics? But massive. I mean, that's the only word I could say because I've just tried and tested examples of this. Just absolutely massive. We, we, we've tested over 6,000 people. We know that on the ankle flex test, everyone needs to get above 10 centimeters and most people don't. So so on the lateral control, like the classic A-frame test, most people don't have these muscle groups switched on. It's where they get the classic knee injuries. And and also for inward steering, if someone's on a steep face or skiing down the John Cian or Tortan with us, where you've got to get that turn, you've got to control your speed. We know that everybody has got that weaker turn direction. And we can identify that weaker turn direction. If you're on the steep face, it's where you you start getting your butterflies going like, oh, God, I wish I was on my other direction to get this this first turn in. Um, might be the same for guys doing the speed test. You know, there'll be one colored gate that they are not comfortable with compared to the other going around and they drop their line, their course of line on. Depends on what level it is. We used to see it in freestyle skiing, you know, seeing injuries that shouldn't have happened. People trying to stomp their landings, going back seat, couldn't flex into their boots. And we're actually creating relationships now with the shops and the retail team. So we're developing this season or launching the Ski Technique Lab expert program, which will be people like, take a few names out of the book, like the Colin Martins, Alex Wallace, they'll end up you know taking on board this educating uh people but to have a much better conversation with uh let's take for example the saturday lad or girl that works inside a ski retailer you know doesn't have that in-depth knowledge of ski instruction but we want to try and pass on this information or knowledge that they can then have a deeper conversation get the people in the right ski kit maybe even ask the guys to see a video of these people skiing you know when they're before they buy a pair of boots Cool. That uh, that sounds interesting. We'll find out more about uh, uh, that, I guess, at the show as well. I mean, the, the Warren Smith Ski Academy, you know, you are the brand. As you've grown, you, I think you've got a team of, uh, what, 15 instructors or so at the moment? Yeah, yeah that's it. That team of 15. How, how, do you, how do you delegate being you to oh, those people? I, th- I think the older I've got, I've just been able to do less. <laughs> just <laughs> not really to the onto uh, to the team. No, I'm really lucky, actually. We've got like a team that's built like a bit of a family. Most of the guys have come through our training programs, actually, like the gap year courses, which we've been doing over 20 years, and they've been really popular. Um, and, it, and, it, and the crew are quite interested in the content. So they're all, they're all like fully qualified level fours. They've gone through their training programs. But they've got their teeth into this element of ski biomechanics. And, and like I said earlier, it's like the part of skiing that you can't really fake or you can't, you know, if someone hasn't got their range of movement, that you can't expect them to put the ski kit on and it's going to suddenly appear. Um, so so they've got they've 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 enjoyed, I think, working in this space and they've got the, you know, the bit between their teeth where they're seeing results now, being able to work remotely. I mean, I'm doing a session in about half an hour 
with someone remotely um, where they're going to be working through the ski technique lab exercises at home, um, 700 miles away. But we're setting up a remote coaching session where then they have got three weeks to go and work. They're going to meet us at NEC show, recheck their scores there, maybe even ski a little bit on the uh, the snow slope that's there and then go to their indoor snow dome. And, and then they're, they're going to be buying a pair of boots, this particular person, and we're going to link them to someone in the shop, show them the footage before they go and have a closer recommendation. So take, trying to take ski coaching to the next level, you know, you look at the guys like Carve, they've done a brilliant job at, at crunching data, building a really cool bit of a device, you know, and all these little elements that we're trying to do, I think we're just trying to make the product for the consumer better. Uh, whoever the consumer might be, it might be a ski instructor doing the level four. It could be someone who's going into their second week of skiing, but we're just trying to make that thing where it isn't just rock up, expect it to work. Cause usually it doesn't. People think they flex their ankles. They don't generally, you know, they usually backseat and this is how the sport has always gone. So we're just trying to interrupt the norm a little bit and get there a bit earlier. Right. OK. And that's good. You mentioned the instructor qualifications because another, you know, uh, a string to your bow is that, uh, you know, you're offering kind of a gap year instructor uh, courses. Yeah. A few years back, I think I'm right in saying that you changed from, you know, offering the Basie course to the yeah. IASI, which is the Irish qualification. Was yeah. that a reaction to, to Brexit? Um, uh, people... We were a bit ahead of the Brexit curve. We did this back in 2013. I mean, I'm, I'm half Irish anyway. I use an Irish passport and citizenship. And and again, my, my friend I sort of grew up with on the ski scene, Pete Gillespie, he he also was fundamental in developing it. But we went to Interski, like the um, Congress back in Argentina. It was a really great event, 2015. But we, the association uh, as an English-speaking exam and something close to home, you know, which was done under the same... I guess in theory, the same countries, you know, there's a lot of IAZ exists at the indoor snow dome at Hemel and chill factory. It was just nice. And the timing felt right to look at an alternative. It didn't always have to be one system. And it did in a way feel like there wasn't anything else close to home. So it was quite a good way of looking at it. It was also financially quite a useful tool because it, it was a little bit um, uh, more cost effective at a time when exchange rates weren't working in our favor. Um, so we managed to, to put the quality of the product out there and not charge more for it. Um, people were doing their qualifications and, and, you know, the pathway was still the same. But when we went further down the line of hearing the first Brexit chat in 2016, which looked like it was going where it was going, we actually then really sort of got behind this because it was, it was clear and the conversations were already out there and, and lo and behold, it has happened. You know, it was more beneficial to have an EU recognized qualification uh, than not. Um, so, you know, the basic qualification is great and, 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 you know, it still works and there's still some great elements to it. It's just that we just, we just chose a slightly different direction and it, and it hasn't gone wrong. If that, if that's the right word to use, it's like both of them work. They're all really quite cool, um, but we just use that and, and we seem to, hasn't put people off, put it that way. Yeah, but, you know, it, that turned out to be an extremely prescient decision to uh, change three years before Britain you know, yeah. decided to, to leave the EU. So that, you know, obviously worked well as well. Well, OK, I think we're coming to the uh, the close now. Now, if people want to find out more about the Warren Smith Ski Academy and, and everything that you offer, they can find you at the National Snow Show at the Birmingham NEC uh, uh, next month, actually October the 15th and 16th. I wonder if I could just ask you, you know, why you're at the show, you know, what people can get out of a visit to your stand. Well, we're, we're actually taking as part of the ticket price or uh, whether, however people have acquired their ticket, we're, they're going to come to the show and people will be getting a certificate at the end of the show with the full breakdown of their biomechanical assessment. So it's like if you've got to turn your legs left and right to make a ski turn, if you've got to lean and make angles, if you've got to absorb and flex, we're going to be assessing every range of movement that, that you need to use in skiing, giving it a score and then giving people an at home working uh, exercise platform. So so we'll be doing a talk on the main stage. We'll be doing a, a thing in the skill center and we'll probably be doing some on site coaching as well. So they'll they'll have that ability to come and get the full the full test done at the show. Brilliant. And, you know, from your point of view, um, you mentioned, you know, people may have looked at uh, some of the videos before or they may have uh, heard of the Academy, but they get a chance to actually meet you and your team and find out a little bit yeah. more about it in person. 
Yeah, absolutely. So we'll be bringing a crew of the, uh, the gang from Verbier across. We're, we're going to be over there for the whole show. And there'll be about six of us on site that will be constant testing. Um, so, yeah, they will come and meet us. I think we're doing a QA and a on the skills stage, um, which will be which will be quite cool. So they can chuck in any question they want about skiing. Hopefully we've got the answer. Um, and then the stage will be doing a, a talk each day. And then, you know, hearing that, that there's going to be some real snow inside there should be quite a, quite a fun thing as well. Yeah, cool. Well, I'm looking forward to uh, being at that show as well. And that's when we'll uh, next uh, get to meet in person, uh, I would imagine. One further question then for this winter, you know, if people are interested in taking your courses, you know, where will you be offering courses this winter? Well, we'll kick off early season skiing in uh, Chavinia Zermatt and and we'll be we'll be literally kicking off our winter the day after that World Cup downhill finishes. So so that's our first course starting on the 6th of November. Um, and then we, we we work through five weeks in Zermatt. Obviously, I'm up on the glacier staying in Chavinia just because it's a bit more cost effective. But we go there, we get guaranteed snow and then we switch back to Verbier mid-December. And then we're in Verbier right the way through till April. And then we're back over to the Zermatt glacier mid-April for a few weeks. In the middle of the season, we'll be going to Japan again. First time since all the COVID craziness and uh so that's our first japan trip for quite a few years i think we finished there in 2020 uh february just before it broke out and um this is the re-engagement of it already so yeah we're very excited to get back there that that's our main program and then we've got a few indoor snow dome courses around october as well i know that you uh, uh love japan you've been out there i think you're taking some quite large groups out there uh you know maybe by the time uh, you finish like 70 yeah. 80 people maybe yeah. 70 odd people across there we, we yeah we love japan it's been i mean god I, that was an eye-opener back in the day and uh, never never knew powder like that existed so yeah got to go back there always yeah always well i think japan uh remains on my bucket list as for uh, yeah. a lot of people but um you know maybe if you wanted to get off a uh, listener you can uh, join warren out there uh, next year uh, that's brilliant warren thanks for sharing your time i know you've uh, a meeting with vocal lined up and you're clearly doing some more online coaching etc so thank you for your time and yeah you all the best uh, for this winter and I look forward to seeing you you know in in just over a month or whenever our paths cross next in fact i am coming out to verbier this winter for my first time in, in several years so oh, it would be amazing if we could you know if you have the time in your uh, schedule we could even get uh, mate, yeah, turns in together. definitely book that in i'd love to have a ski that'd be brilliant I'll, I'll make some time for that for sure cool excellent all right really good to speak to you thanks very much